Hello everyone, the internet turns 30 today and to celebrate this achievement, I welcome you to the first episode of the Popsicle Podcast featuring Dr. Kate Shaw. She is a physicist at CERN, the same place where Sir Tim Berners-Lee started the internet 30 years ago. We are here to talk about life at CERN and a really important initiative which brings science communication to developing countries. So without further ado, let's get into it. I am Spursh and this is Popsicle. Dr. Kate Shaw, thank you so much for joining us for the podcast. Now, before we begin, I'm really curious to know how you were inspired into science. So what were the basic motivational factors that drove you into becoming a physicist? So, um, hi, so first of all, thanks a lot for having me uh, on your podcast. So, yeah, I've always been fascinated with physics. Um, I was going to be a physicist when I was 11 years old, for certain. Oh, wow. Um, and the inspiration really for physics came from Stephen Hawking. I read his brief history of time when I was 9, 10, 11, and I suddenly decided I wanted to be a cosmologist. Now, I'm a particle physicist. It's not quite the same, but obviously, when you're 10 years old, you don't know the difference so well. Um, and I was just always interested in how the world worked. I used to love taking electronic equipment apart, everything I could. I was just fascinated with the world around me. Now, talking about CERN, we know it's a large lab, but what is it all about? Um, so, CERN is the largest particle physics laboratory in the world. Um, so, at CERN is the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC which is um, uh, a particle accelerator, 100 meters underground, 27 kilometers in circumference, and it accelerates particles, specifically protons, up to almost the speed of light, and then it smashes them together at very high energies inside one of four detectors. So I work on the Atlas detector. So the idea of the detector is to um, try and uh, detect the debris from the collision Uh, to see if we can work out what happened uh, in that collision. So uh, a typical day at CERN for me would entail um, uh, a lot of my day actually revolves around the canteen, which is called Restaurant One at CERN. So that's where you might meet friends in the morning for coffee uh, and a chat about what you guys, you know, what we've been up to. And then we'd have um, preparation for meetings. Uh, Some of the meetings are in person. So you, you give a presentation in a room full of your co-scientists and a lot of them are actually online so we do it uh, over video conferences and um, yeah we also spend time in the control room where we monitor the detector uh, and we might also do offline monitoring of the data so that means um, the day after the data has been taken we want to make sure that uh, there was no problem with the data or it was collected properly or if there was any issues to fix them. And, uh, of course, then we do analysis. So that means looking at the end bulk of the data and trying to understand more about the universe by reconstructing fundamental particles. Sun seems to be super huge. So how many people do you usually work with there? So, um, so my collaboration, Atlas, is 3,000 scientists and engineers. So, But they're not all based at CERN. They're based all over the world. Um, I have collaborators... Um, you know, in Chile, to Australia, to India, to, um, uh, yeah, to South Africa, say, all over the world. Um, At CERN, there's even more than 3,000 people. I think around 10,000 people work uh, at CERN. So a huge, huge number of scientists and engineers. It's a real hub where they get to come together at physics all day, every day. Now, coming to your own project, Physics Without Frontiers, it really seems an interesting topic. But can you please give a brief summary of what you do at the project? Yeah, so Physics Without Frontiers is about everybody having access uh, to physics. So it doesn't matter if you're, you know, that I grew up in a very small village in the east of the UK. It doesn't matter if you're there, if you're some, you know, giant city, say, in Mumbai in India. Um, that everybody should uh, get access to science, to research, and should be exposed to scientists all over the world. Um, And the one thing about scientists is uh, that we travel. We go all over the world to give conferences and talks and to collaborate. 
So the idea of Physics Without Frontiers is to have uh, our volunteer scientists go to countries all over the world to talk about science and physics um, and to inspire young people to make sure that they, um, you know, sometimes when you study physics or science at high school, it can be a bit difficult. Um, so we really want to make sure that we communicate the fun side of science. It's not just learning mathematics and learning some stuff that, you know, um, can be a little bit challenging at the beginning. Once you have those tools, you can do amazing types of science. And so we send scientists all over the world to talk about um, research, to talk about um, high, you know, interesting new developments in, in physics and mathematics. This program seems really interesting and can actually create an impact on our society. But being the co-founder of this project, how did you find the inspiration to do such work? I mean, I founded the project because I've always been very passionate about physics. Uh, I do it every day of my life. Uh, but where I grew up, uh, in a very, very small village, 250 people, a long way from, even from the nearest town, we didn't have any scientists nearby. And so I got my inspiration, obviously, from books. Um, but the inspiration with Physics Without Frontiers is to go everywhere and to have scientists be able to talk directly to university students mainly, but also high school students about physics. So that's what really inspired me. And of course, I mean, ICTP, the International Centre of Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy, their main motivation is to support specifically scientists in developing countries um, to make sure that they have the tools um, and funds needed to be able to do uh, good science. So it's really in line with what they do at ICTP. But I guess for that, you would need to travel a lot. So under this initiative, what places have you been to? Well, so would be, it's not only, I should say, it's not just me that goes. Uh, we have a big team of uh, volunteer scientists. So I coordinate the projects and I do some of the projects myself, but not all of them. But last year, for example, I was in Nepal, in Kathmandu, uh, doing a, a winter school in particle physics. I also went to Afghanistan. I went to, last year, Guatemala as well. We also had projects in Zimbabwe, in uh, Venezuela. In the past, we've also been to Algeria and Vietnam, uh, Lebanon. So we're really... Um, going all over the world and we're trying to expand the project this year to even more countries. Now going to such war torn and dangerous places there might arise some issues about the whole project's godlessness. Did you ever face any issues in these places? Yes, yeah, so one of the wonderful things about travelling to all these different countries is you then meet people from so many different cultures. Um, but I've never had any problems with any of the places I've been because science is a universal language and so no matter where I am I'm they're my scientific brothers and sisters if you like if I'm talking to people in Afghanistan or Nepal or Guatemala we're all same we're all scientists fascinated with exactly the same thing the way we talk to each other is exactly the same uh, and that always really inspires me the way that un physics really is universal that range just have, you know we have different cultures and different uh, with physics and with science, it's we're all brothers and sisters. So I've never actually had any problems going to any of these countries. UNESCO support all the logistics and the travel. So even when the places are a little bit complicated to get you geographically, um, we always manage. Understandably, it is hard to do science without effective science communication. Do you believe that there is a gap in science that needs fixing? Do you, you mean? Uh, there is a gap that can, yeah, that can widen. So the internet, obviously, over the last 20 years has allowed uh, people from all countries now are more able to access scientific results. Um, there's an issue with um, scientific publishing that a lot of the scientific journals, you have to pay quite a high fee. So richer universities can afford this fee. And of course, universities with much less funding, they can't afford it. And of course, access to science should not be dependent on the amount of money that your university has. So that's um, something that really needs to be looked at and solved and with more open uh, science this is becoming more and more um, open to everybody. But um, yeah, the stronger ties we have, uh, the stronger networks scientists have, 
and the more science communication done within a country by scientists, by science enthusiasts and by communicators, um, the more everyday people on the street will know about latest developments in physics. Moving on to another very interesting issue that you've been talking about and that's gender inequality in science. You have given multiple talks at Royal Society, UCL, CERN Summer School. Uh, why do you think in science this inequality exists in the first place? Um, it's a very good question and it, it's, it's a very complicated question because of course the issue of um, women in science comes down to really the issue of women in society. So, um, and then everything comes into a historical context. So, I mean, as you probably know, about 100 years ago, um, women couldn't even become fellows of the Royal Society um, and wouldn't be taken seriously as scientists at all. So the, that's the historical element that um, things don't change overnight. Um, it takes a little bit of time um, for, um, for things to change, um, not just on the ground, but also in people's minds. So often when people see that Dr. Shaw has contacted them, they would assume that I'm a man, even today. Even today when we have plenty of women, you know, doctors, physicists, etc., uh, people might still assume that I'm a man. And that's not necessarily due to sexism as such. That's just due to um, uh, the historical way that women didn't used to be engaged or weren't allowed to be engaged in science. So there is a gap that... The gap is also due to many other things, of course, uh, when you're when girls are younger, um, when they're at school, sometimes they're not encouraged to do science. People are like science is a boy thing. They can be encouraged and they encourage girls to do other things. And then there's an issue um, when you're older, because, of course, if you want to do research, uh, you need to do uh, postdoctoral fellowships when you have to travel around quite a lot. And if you want to have children um, for a woman, you need to take a little bit of time off work and that could be very difficult to then come back afterwards and either be able to get a job in the first place or um, or also just having that break can disrupt um, compared to your fellows how many papers you've published etc so there's lots of different interweaving issues uh, with women in science from my side the most important thing is to uh, encourage and to uh, be like a role model if you like for young girls so that they don't think it's a guy thing and they don't think it's only something that um, men, men can go for. Um, so that they feel empowered. If you do physics or if you want to do science, it's not being like male, it's a female thing to do as well. It's a human thing to do. When you travel to such developing countries, do you see gender inequality in these STEM developing countries as well? Um, so it's really dependent on the country and the region. Um, in, for example, in Arab countries, such as Palestine, where I've worked, and Algeria and Lebanon, there's more women that study physics than men, many more. In fact, in Palestine, there's a the gender uh, gap is the other way. You have something like 80% women and only 20% men. Um, but there's always an issue because, again, of culture intercepting so in other places for example in Nepal where I was working in Kathmandu we've been going for the last four years um, the number of females is really low I think in a class of 50 there might be two or three students um, so this is something that needs to be taken to an account um, also because the, um, the issue of women in science is cultural um, it's different in every country so I think it's really important to take the, 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 the local cultural um, situation into account when you're trying to support women. Uh, you can't just say, oh, this is the issue that women have in this country, therefore it's the same in another country. It's totally different reasons in different places. Um, but hopefully, through science and through gender equality in all countries, women will get more uh, recognised. And now, my final question to you is that what one message would you like to give to the millennial generation? <laughs> one message for the millennial generation. I would say, um, you know, the world is a very big and inspiring and um, complicated and different place. And so it's a, 
great uh, opportunity, if you can, to learn as much as you can about it and see where you can fit in your passion to making, to contributing to the world. I think that's what my message would be, to follow your passion and to see how it fits in to this crazy big world we live in. Dr. Kate Shaw, thank you so much for joining us for the podcast. I really hope that you enjoyed the podcast as much as we did. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, really. I really like this initiative. I think it's great. I think it's a really interesting thing you're doing. And well, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed the first episode of the Popsicle Podcast. Please do like, share and subscribe to the channel if you like this. Thanks for watching.